On March 29th, 2010, the cargo vessel MV Iceberg set off from the port of Aden on a journey to Dubai. The ship was an old, rusty vessel carrying 24 crew members from different nations, along with a heavy load of generators and transformers. Normally, the journey from Aden to Dubai would take the MV Iceberg about a week. But on this particular day, something traumatic would transpire that would change the destiny of the ship and its crew. Just 12 hours into the journey, the MV Iceberg was attacked by Somali pirates. Eight masked men in a skiff armed with AK-47 circled the boat, peppering the rusty ship with bullets. The ship had no security whatsoever and was far too slow to outrun the skiff. It didn't take long for the pirates to board the vessel and hijack it. And thus began the world's longest maritime hijacking. For 1,000 days, the pirates held the 24 crew members hostage, subjecting them to a nightmare of physical and mental torture. The crew was held in a 25-square-meter room so hot it was difficult to breathe. They were repeatedly beaten and tortured, denied sleep, and forced to eat filthy food and drink dirty water. The third officer was murdered, and another crew member became so desperate he committed suicide. But perhaps worst of all was the sense of complete abandonment and isolation that the hostages had to endure. When the Somali pirates demanded a $10 million ransom, the owner of the ship disowned the vessel and its crew. The governments of the various crew members refused to pay the ransom. And as the weeks turned to months and the months turned to years, it became apparent that no one was coming to rescue the hostages. Even the hijackers told them, no one is coming for you. No one cares about you. It seemed that there was no way out for the men captured on board the MV Iceberg. Life became an endless nightmare of suffering with no hope, no help, and no hand to deliver. But then, after 32 months of bondage, suddenly and unexpectedly, help appeared. A rescue team from the Puntland Maritime Military attacked the pirates. After a two-week gun battle, the pirates were defeated and the 22 remaining hostages were freed. When all hope was lost and death seemed certain, suddenly deliverance came. The captives were set free and the nightmare was over. Their ordeal was finished. There's a powerful lesson for all of us in the amazing true story of the longest maritime hijacking in history. You see, just like the hostages on board the MV Iceberg, every one of us has been held captive against our will by the forces of darkness. When we started out on the journey of life, it didn't take long for the enemy to attack us. Sin captured us, Satan held us, and hope turned its back on us. Mental, emotional, and even physical bondage and abuse were meted out to us. We had no strength in our own power to overcome, and it seemed like no one cared. Hope was lost as life became an endless bondage to sin and Satan and death. But then, when it seemed as if man could never escape, Jesus came to earth. He came to seek and save the lost. He came to rescue us from the hands of our enemies and to free us from everything that holds us in bondage. And when Jesus died on the cross, he won a victory for all of mankind. When he said, it is finished. He proclaimed for all of eternity that we could be free. And when Jesus rose from the dead, he manifested the totality of his victory. In his completed work at Calvary, we receive life, forgiveness, freedom, healing, hope, salvation. That's the powerful truth we're going to discover today in our sermon titled, It Is Finished. But before we learn more, let us pray. Almighty and everlasting Father, we thank you that when no hope seemed on the horizon, when all hope seemed gone, Lord, we thank you that when we felt abandoned and lost and held captive by sin and Satan and death, you took pity on us. You looked from heaven and you wouldn't leave us, but you sent your son Jesus to come and seek and save the lost. Thank you for dying for us. 
Thank you, Jesus, for rising again. Thank you, Father, for sending your Son and sending the power of your glory to bring him to life. Thank you that in his victory, we have victory. Thank you that in his death, our old ways have died, and in his resurrection, we have newness of life. Thank you that you speak to us today. Our nightmare is finished. Our bondage is finished. Our sin is finished. The power of Satan is finished, and we are set free. Now speak to us, O Lord. We submit to you. We bind every voice of the devil that would come to deceive or disturb or distract us. And in the name of the Lord Jesus, I loose the power of the Holy Spirit, the power to enlighten our hearts, to give us grace to obey, the power to find resurrection life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I want to invite every one of you to join your faith with mine right now. Just put your hand on your chest and say after me, Lord Jesus, speak to my heart. Change my life. Manifest your glory in me. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, hello, everyone, and happy Easter. This day marks the greatest event in human history, the day when Jesus Christ rose from the dead. On Friday, we marked the day when Jesus died on the cross for our sins. The Bible tells us that on the cross, Jesus defeated sin and Satan. And then on Easter Sunday, Jesus rose from the dead by the power and the glory of God. The stone was rolled away. The grave clothes were thrown aside. And the Lord Jesus rose with a new and resurrected body. The triumphant power of God conquered death. Jesus defeated every adversary and brought eternal life to all of us. He rose from the dead. The grave couldn't keep him. Death couldn't hold him. The devil couldn't defeat him. The Pharisees couldn't silence him. Sin couldn't conquer him. He is the living God, the everlasting Savior, and the risen King. So just lift your hand and say after me, Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. He is risen indeed. And best of all, because Jesus lives, we live also. His victory is our victory as well. Because he defeated death, we are also free from the power of death. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And when he lives in us, we will live for eternity with him. That's why Easter is much more than a historical event. That's why today is a day we celebrate, not just because of what happened 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem, but because of what it means for us today and forever. The event of the resurrection is more than a historical fact. It's a life-changing reality for all of us who believe in Jesus Christ. For you see, just before Jesus gave up his life on the cross, he said, it is finished. John chapter 19 verses 28 and 30 tells us this. Jesus knew, Jesus knew that his mission was now finished. Jesus said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And in those three simple words, it is finished. We have the most powerful declaration of victory ever made. We have the confidence that the battle is over, the war is won, and we have victory in Christ over every enemy that ever stood against us. So let's take some time today to discover in detail what these truths mean for us. We're going to look at a scripture text today found in Colossians 2, 13 to 15 and verse 20 that's going to break down the finished work of Jesus. In this passage, we receive the details of what was finished on the cross. Now, receive the word of the Lord. God made you alive with Christ for he forgave all your sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Christ has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. May the Lord bless the reading of his word to your heart today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Think carefully about what the Apostle Paul is telling us in this passage. He's actually listing three things Jesus finished when he died and rose again. And here's the first thing that was finished. My debt of sin is finished. 
For that's how our scripture text begins. In Colossians 2, 13 and 14, the Bible says, He forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. So the very first thing that Jesus finished with his death and resurrection is my debt of sin. By his death and resurrection, my sins are forgiven, my debt is removed, and it's paid in full. And this is the greatest news any man can ever hear. For the fact is, we've all sinned. I've sinned, you've sinned, we're all guilty, and we cannot come to God in our condition of sin. Romans 3.23 tells us everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. And then Romans 6.23 tells us the consequences. The wages of sin is death. And the problem of sin is the number one problem in the world today. Every war, every murder, every rape, every racism, every evil act comes from sin. Adam sinned and his sin brought death and now every one of us have followed his footsteps and death has spread to all of us. For Romans 5, 12 says, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone for everyone sinned. And that sin not only brought death to us, it also separated every one of us from God. Listen to God's word in Isaiah 59 verse 2. Your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. So when man sinned, death entered into us. And worst of all, when man sinned, we became separated from God. The only one who could save us, the only one who could bring us back to life, the only one who could give us hope was now distant from us. We couldn't reach God in our own power, and God refused to hear us. Sin formed a wall, a barrier between man and God, and there was nothing we could do to break through. See, if there was something you could do on your own to get to God, then why did Jesus die on the cross? If there was a way for you to break through the wall of sin and earn forgiveness, then Jesus did not need to die. Jesus didn't need to suffer. If you could pray enough or give enough or do enough good works, then there was no need for Christ to suffer in agony. There was no need for his pain and death. If you could get your own way back to God, Jesus didn't need to die. But there was nothing any one of us could do, like hostages on the end of the iceberg. We had no hope, no strength, no way out. We had to have a savior. We had to have someone who could rescue us from sin and save us from death. We had to have someone who could come and deliver us and make a way back to God. And that's why Jesus died. That's why he rose again. That's why he came to bring us back to God. For 1 Peter 3.18 says, Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. That's the good news we can learn from Kingsley's story. Many years ago, a man named Kingsley lived in the village with his wife and children. Kingsley loved his family very much, and for many years, they lived happily together. But one day, Kingsley lost his job. His family fell on hard times, and they became very poor. It broke Kingsley's heart to hear his children crying at night because of hunger. So in desperation, Kingsley went out and did something he never thought he would do. He broke into a shop and stole some money. Well, before he knew what had happened, the police caught Kingsley. He went to court and was convicted of stealing, was sentenced to three years in prison. Suddenly, his whole life had fallen apart. His wife and family were disgraced. He was separated from the ones he loved. Kingsley didn't know if he would ever be able to go back home. For three long years, Kingsley languished alone in prison. He was too far from home for his wife to visit. All he could think about was how he disgraced his family and ruined his life. He didn't know if his wife and his family would forgive him for what he'd done. Finally, when his time in prison was almost over, he sat down and wrote a letter to his wife. He told her he was sorry for what he'd done. He told her that he, he wanted to come home, but he knew she might not want to take him back. So this is what he asked her to do. If she would forgive him for the disgrace he had caused her, and if she was willing to take him home, then he asked her to give him a sign. He asked her to tie 
a yellow ribbon on the big old mango tree that sat on the roadside in front of their compound. When he left the prison, he would ride the bus to his hometown. If he saw the yellow ribbon on the mango tree, then Kingsley would get down from the bus and come home. But if she refused to forgive him and she didn't want him to come home, she should not tie any yellow ribbon on the mango tree. When he rode the bus to town, if he looked out the window and saw no yellow ribbon, then he would just stay on the bus and never go home again. He would move on to the next town and never come back. Well, finally, the fateful day arrived for Kingsley to leave the prison. With uncertainty and fear, he boarded the bus that would take him to his hometown. For hours, he rode on the bus, not knowing what he would see when he arrived home. Would there be a yellow ribbon on the mango tree? Would his family forgive him and welcome him home? Or had he lost all chance at being reunited with them? Was his sin too great to be forgiven? The bus got closer and closer to his hometown. Kingsley's heart began to race. He could barely look out the window to see his fate. Would there be a yellow ribbon? The bus got closer and closer. There was just one more bend in the road, and then he would see the old mango tree in front of his house. He held his breath. He bit his lip and closed his eyes. And then suddenly, the bus rounded the final bend in the road. Kingsley opened his eyes, and when he did... He could hardly believe what he saw, for there, on the old mango tree, a hundred yellow ribbons fluttered in the breeze. All across the tree, from top to bottom on every branch, yellow ribbons called out to him, Welcome home! Welcome home! Welcome home! Stop the bus! Kingsley shouted, Stop the bus! I've come home! The bus stopped. Kingsley jumped off and ran into the arms of his wife and children. And friends, just like Kingsley, you may have gone far from God. You may have done things you never thought you would do. You may feel sinful and shameful, and you're separated from God. But God wants you to know something today. No matter what you've done, no matter what you've become, he's always ready to forgive you and receive you back home. When Jesus died on the cross, he put a 100,000 yellow ribbons on that old tree that say, welcome home. And when he cried out, it is finished. It means that everything, everything we need to come home to God has been provided for us. Every barrier has been removed. Every wall has been torn down. Every hindrance has been overcome. By the blood of Jesus, our sins can be forgiven. By the death of Jesus, we become alive. By his resurrection, we become new. By his sacrifice, the separation between God and man is gone forever, and we can come home to Jesus. That's why when Jesus cried out, the curtain in the temple was torn in two. Listen to what the Bible says in Matthew 27, 50 and 51. Then Jesus shouted out again and he released his spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. See, at the time of Jesus' death, the Jews worshipped in the temple. And at the very center of the temple was a place called the Holy of Holies. This is where it was believed that God's presence dwelt most intensely. And the Holy of Holies was separated by a thick, big curtain that hung from the top to the bottom. No one could enter the Holy Holies except for one priest one time a year. This priest had to be completely pure and had to go through all a manner of rituals before he was worthy to enter behind the curtain. And this curtain served as a separation between God and man. The curtain separated us from God. But when Jesus died on the cross, that curtain in the temple was ripped in two from top to bottom. God reached down with his own hand from heaven and removed that barrier so that we could all come home to him. And now, everyone, every one of us has access to God through Jesus Christ because of Easter. For Easter is God reaching out to bring us home. 
No matter how great your sin, God's love is greater. No matter how weak your will, God's power is stronger. No matter how low you go, God's love goes deeper. He saves, he heals, he forgives, he redeems, and he longs to bring you close to his side and walk with you every day. That's why in Isaiah 118, the Lord says, come now, let's settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, I will make them as white as wool. Then later in Isaiah 43, 25, God says, I, yes, I alone will blot out your sins for my own sake and will never think of them again. Maybe you're watching or listening today and you feel guilty over your sin. Maybe you're caught up in shame for the things you've done. You wonder if God could ever forgive you. You feel so unworthy. You doubt if God will receive you back to his family. But God sent me here today to speak to you about experiencing forgiveness. God wants you to know that when you confess your sins to him and ask him to forgive you, then he does forgive you. And God says to you today, I've already forgiven you and when God forgives you it means your sins are washed away he's removed them by his blood and Psalm 103 11 to 12 says for his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth he's removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west The Bible says God removed them as far as the east from the west. The problem for many of us is that we doubt God's forgiveness. We don't necessarily feel forgiven. So we don't really believe we're forgiven. So even though we're forgiven, we act like we're not. You think your sins are still looking around. You feel unworthy. You feel dirty. You feel shame. You feel guilty. But God says to you today, don't live by your feelings. Live by faith. Believe the word of God. For it says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all, somebody say all, from all wickedness. And not only are you washed, but your shame is removed today. He's taken your shame and made you worthy by his grace. And not only are you cleansed and made worthy, but he's drawn you near to himself. You can be as close to God as anyone alive today. Your prayers can be just as effective, just as powerful as any man of God. For Jesus has removed every barrier and every separation and brought you into the presence of the Father. You don't need a prophet. You don't need a priest. You don't need Mary, the mother of God. You don't need a saint. You don't need anybody. You can come straight to God the Father through Jesus. For you see, no pit is too deep that God's love isn't deeper. It is finished. So I declare shame off you today. I declare sin off you today. I declare guilt off you today. I declare remorse and regret off you today in Jesus' name. And when you walk in that new way of life, you come to the second thing that is finished. My enemy's power is finished. Listen to how our scripture text continues in Colossians 2.15. He, that is Jesus, disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. And think about what this means for all of us. On the cross, Jesus destroyed the works of the devil. He disarmed Satan. He won the victory over Satan. The battle is over. The war has been won. It is finished means that you have victory over Satan and over every demon power. For the fact is when Jesus disarmed the devil, it simply means that Satan has no ammunition against you. Satan may be stronger than you and he may be bigger than you, but Jesus has disarmed him and armed you instead. Jesus has taken away all of Satan's ammunition. And when you're out of ammunition, you can't win the war. That's the powerful lesson we can learn from the defeat of Sir Charles McCarthy and the British Army right here in Ghana. On January 20th, 1824, Sir Charles McCarthy camped by the River Pra on the border of the Ashanti Confederacy. McCarthy was a brigadier general in the British Army and Britain's appointed governor of West Africa as the head of all British forces in the Gold Coast and as the representative of the king himself, McCarthy felt confident in his plan to attack the Ashanti Kingdom. 
things certainly looked favorable to McCarthy. He had a force of over 12,000 men at his command. And on that very night, these troops were on the move to join him at the River Pra. He had superior weaponry over the outnumbered Ashantis, and McCarthy had won other battles over other enemies in the past. Yet in spite of all those advantages, Sir Charles McCarthy and his troops suffered a humiliating defeat at the hands of the Ashanti kingdom. In fact, on January 21st, 1824, Britain suffered its worst military defeat ever on Ghanaian soil. McCarthy himself died in battle, and hundreds of his troops were killed or wounded or captured as the Ashantis won a resounding victory. What led to the surprising defeat of Sir Charles McCarthy? In the heat of the battle, McCarthy ordered up supplies and ammunition to attack the Ashantis. But when they opened the crates of bullets, they found macaroni instead. The British ran out of bullets, and the Ashanti warriors easily overcame them in hand-to-hand -hand combat. McCarthy and the British were defeated for one simple reason. They had no ammunition. And you can't win a battle when you're disarmed. And that's exactly what the Bible says has happened to Satan. On the cross, Jesus disarmed the devil. He took away his ammunition and left him powerless to overcome the children of God. Jesus has disarmed the devil. And you need to know today that the power of Satan is broken. You need to know today that the devil is limited. You need to know today that no matter how he may threaten you, Satan is a defeated, disarmed foe. See, Satan may talk like he's my he may boast of his weapons and try to frighten you with his speech. But you know something, friends? Talk is cheap. There have been many that have come into the world with a lot of talking. There have been many sermons made and prophecies given and holy writings recorded, all making claims to the truth. All religions boast, but only Jesus Christ has made a demonstration of power. Christianity is the only religion that has a leader who rose from the dead. If you go to Medina in Saudi Arabia, you can see the grave of Mohammed. If you go to China, you can find the grave of Confucius. If you travel to Israel, you'll find the graves of the patriarchs of Judaism and the tomb of the founder of the Baha'i religion. If you travel to Pakistan, you'll see the grave of the founder of the Sikh religion. But if you go to Jerusalem today, there's no cemetery where Jesus' tomb can be located. There's a place where they say he was buried, but no one claims his body is still there. Even those who don't don't follow Jesus. Even those who don't believe in Jesus have never claimed to find his body. No one, not Muslims, not Jews, not Buddhists, not Hindus, not Sikhs, no one from any religion has ever made the claim, I found Jesus' grave with his corpse inside. For the simple truth is this, Jesus' grave does not exist. The place where he was buried is empty. The tomb they laid his body in is abandoned. There is no grave, no tomb, no cemetery that contains the remains of Jesus Christ. For he is not dead. He's alive. He's risen again. So let me tell you something today about my Jesus. I don't know what Jesus you believe in, but I believe in the Jesus of the Bible. I believe in a Jesus who rose from the dead and conquered the grave. I believe in the Jesus who heals the sick and casts out devils. I believe in the Jesus who is King of kings and Lord of lords. And there is nobody like my Jesus. He's the great and mighty God, the awesome Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He's the God who created the heavens and the earth. He was always there and he will always exist. He lives in eternity and he rules over the universe. His throne is in heaven and his footstool is on earth. He created all the angels and all the powers. He knows where they are and what they're up to. He knows their end and has counted their days. He's prepared a place of judgment for Satan and every demon and every witch and every wizard. And I'm here to tell you today, there is no comparison between my Jesus and Satan. So don't you dare compare the enemy to Jesus. They're not even close to being the same. Don't you dare act as if the devil has power that can rival the power of Almighty Jesus. 
For Satan is not omnipresent. He's not present in all places at all times. In fact, the devil can only be in one place at one time. Listen to Job 2.2. 2. The Bible says, And the Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. See, Satan was roaming the earth. He wasn't flying. He was walking. He wasn't everywhere. He was only in one place at one time. You know, many people believe the devil flies, but I don't believe that. I think he has to trek from place to place. Jesus himself said, I saw Satan fall. Everybody say fall. Fall like lightning from heaven. If Satan could fly, how could he fall from heaven? And since he fell, he's left trekking around the earth. He's not everywhere. He's only in one place at a time. But God, God is everywhere at all times. Not only that, but Satan is not omniscient. He doesn't know everything. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8 says, We speak the wisdom of God, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The devil doesn't know everything. He doesn't know the future. He doesn't know God's plans. He doesn't know what you're thinking. If the devil knew the victory that Christ would win over him on the cross, he would not have allowed Jesus to be crucified. But the fact is, Satan is not omniscient and he's not omnipotent or all-powerful. There's only one omnipotent God. There's only one all-powerful God and his name is Jesus. That's why Philippians 2, 9 to 11 says, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, somebody say Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory glory of God the Father. So go ahead and acknowledge it with me and say, Jesus Christ is Lord. For the fact is the devil has been defeated. The devil has been disarmed. And no matter how he boasts and no matter how he threatens, his fate is sealed. When Jesus says, it is finished, the enemy was finished, and there's no way he can change his fate. Anyone can boast, but God's kingdom comes with power. That's why 1 Corinthians 4.20 says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. And when God raised Christ from the dead, he demonstrated the power that is above every other power. He defeated the greatest enemy known to man. He broke the chains of the strongest foe and easily cast him aside. He didn't just talk, he acted. He demonstrated power when he rose from the dead on Easter morning. When I was a little boy, my father was an officer in the military. He was often gone away on duty, sent out on assignments that took him far from home. Sometimes we would not see my father for months at a time. Once he was even gone for more than one year. During those times, my friends would ask me about my dad. Sometimes we would sit around as boys and brag about our fathers. One boy would say, my dad is a rich banker. Another would say, my dad owns his own company. I would boast to them that my dad was a brave military officer serving our country. I would tell them he was a powerful man who wore a uniform covered with special medals and awards. But when a long time would pass and no one had ever seen my father, then not everyone was convinced. Some may have thought I had no father. Some may have believed he wasn't who I claimed. Some may have wondered if I was hiding the truth that perhaps my dad was in prison or had run away from my family. But when my dad returned home, dressed in his full military uniform, then all doubt was put to rest. No one could claim I had no father. No one could claim my dad was a prisoner. No one could accuse me of lying. His presence was the proof. He was the evidence. And so it is with the resurrected Jesus. When Jesus appeared out of the empty tomb, he proved God's power. He is the evidence of God's reality. He is the demonstration that God has all power and controls all things and rules over all. He is alive, and that can mean only one thing. God is almighty, and Jesus Christ is Lord. 
Jesus' death on the cross and resurrection back to life is the proof of God's power. The devil will try to tell you that God is not able to help you. The devil will try to trick you into doubt and unbelief. But go today to the empty tomb and remember, Jesus is not there. Go to the witnesses in the Bible, hundreds who saw him in his resurrected state. They testify to us, Jesus is alive. The evidences are clear, Jesus is alive. And no matter what anyone else may say, Jesus is alive. No matter how anything may look to you today, there's only one truth, only one reality that really matters. There's only one piece of evidence you need to believe in. Jesus is alive. He rose from the dead. And in that one fact, and that one fact alone, we have the proof of God's power, the proof that Jesus is Lord, and the proof that he can deliver you and me from death as well. For you see, the good news is this, that same power, that same might is available to all of us who believe in him. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians 1, 18 to 20, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us. Somebody say for us, for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. That power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is for us. See, friends, the victory of the resurrection is for all of us. The triumphant power of Easter marches on today. It wasn't a one-time victory. It's an ongoing, everlasting victory. It wasn't just for Christ. It was for all of us. When Jesus rose from the dead, he not only opened the tomb, he opened a way for new life to all who believe. He didn't triumph just so that he could be delivered from death. He triumphed so that all of us could be delivered from death. He didn't just defeat the devil himself. He defeated the devil and disarmed him so that you and I could also rule over him. And Jesus gives us his authority today. That's why in Luke 10, 19, he said, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. And Jesus has put this power in our hands so that we can enforce his victory in our world today. We can't simply observe his victory like spectators in a stadium. We must experience in our lives. The resurrection is a shared victory. It has a direct impact on you and me today. And that brings us to our third truth. My bondage is finished and my celebration has begun. Listen to how our text ends today. In Colossians 2.20, the Bible says, Christ has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. Sin is finished. Satan is finished. And not only that, but every other power, every other enemy, every other bondage is finished as well. We can live new lives, free from all bondage, because God's resurrection power is complete power. It is total power. See, friends, when Jesus defeated death, he defeated the strongest enemy known to man. And by defeating the strongest enemy ever known to man, it proves once and for all that Jesus' power is the greatest power of all. That's why the Bible says in Acts 2.24, God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Death couldn't hold him. The grave couldn't keep him. And Jesus not only conquered death once, he defeated death forever. For Romans 6, 9 says, Christ was raised from the dead and we know that he cannot die again. Death has no power over him now. So lift your hands and shout, no power. There's no chance for death again. Jesus can never die. Death can never come again. That's the power of the resurrection, a complete and total and eternal power. Christ's power is now our power. Christ's victory is now our victory. He rose from the dead and shares that power with us. For God tells us in Romans 6, 3 to 5, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Since we've been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. Because Jesus finished, I can finish. Because he won, I win. Because he's seated on the throne in heaven, I can be seated on a throne in heaven. When I look to him and follow him, 
I will succeed like Jesus succeeded. His grace and power, his resurrection life in me will cause me to finish my race in victory. That's why Easter is a celebration. Whenever a project is finished, there's a celebration. Whenever a degree is completed, there's a graduation. Whenever a building is finished, there's a dedication. And at Easter, we declare, it is finished. At Easter, we acknowledge the completed work of Jesus. He died on the cross and rose again. Every enemy is defeated. My debt of sin is paid. My enemy is disarmed. And my bondage is broken. It's time to rejoice. It's time to celebrate Jesus' resurrection and victory. Would you join me in celebration? Father, thank you so much for the victory of Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for dying and rising again. Thank you for winning the victory over every enemy. Thank you, Lord, that you share this victory, this power with us. Now I speak a blessing over your people as we celebrate your great victory today. I impart life and health and peace and deliverance and forgiveness and faith and salvation and anointing and prosperity into their lives. In the mighty name of Jesus, every enemy, every bondage, every chain holding your people. I command it broken and I loose the sons and daughters of God today for the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us. So therefore quicken our mortal bodies, Lord, that we might walk in new life and walk in victory for it is finished.